Bibles, if you will, to the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 6. We're going to start right at verse 1. Mark 6. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, Jesus began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that's been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this the carpenter? The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? They took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And Jesus could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. He was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake the dust off that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I gotta take you back a bit. I know you, you remember the one I just read, but the first one that Brian read about David. Our, our Old Testament reading there, our Old Testament reading, and follow me on this, it begins with a plea to recognize kinship. To recognize that we're family. All right, we're relatives. The tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel had long been separated from the southern tribes known as Judah. And these northern, this northern kingdom called Israel comes to David, who's the newly established king of Judah. And they ask to be included under his leadership and authority because they recognize a relationship. Recognize a relationship. They acknowledge that David has long been the source of their strength and direction, even while Saul was still called the king. They wanted to be united again as one nation, one people, shepherded by David. So they called on their kinship. They said, don't forget, we're, we're the same. We are your bone and flesh. We're relatives, they argue. How can you refuse to unite with us to rule over us? We are family. We are home. <coughs> then and now, home is a place of safety first and then comfort and sustenance. When you want a good cooked meal, where do you go? You go home. You go home. So they're saying, come home to the security of this place that we built under God. Come home. Now I feel God has blessed the United States of America. And I can justify that statement. I can justify it. I can justify it with my cable bill. All right, now you have to follow me on this because you know I'm a little different. Thank you, Jerry, for, for being the first one to acknowledge that's a good way to do it. All right? Because i got to tell you, this is evident to me, that today in America we have such freedom, such freedom, that we can select on our television any show or movie at any time we want to watch it. We can do that. We can do that. 
We have the freedom to choose, even in the midst of watching it, to pause it. Now, I have been to the movie theater. I have been to the movie theater, and in the middle of the movie, my 32-ounce Coca-Cola, <laughs> full liter, empty, I stood up and screamed at the projectionist, stop the film. I need a refill. It was free with that $24 purchase of a soda and popcorn and my $7 ticket for admittance. They would not stop the film. But at home, at home, I could pause it, refill my beverage, come back days later, Brian, dig this, days later, go back to it, hit play, and guess what? It starts at the very second I paused it, days before. How about that? I have the freedom to do that. Truly, we are blessed. <laughs> now, you have to know that I watch a lot of television. Okay, so that's why I have a lot of cable. Patty, do I watch some TV? But I told Patty, I said, if you wanted to show, uh, I should have, for a picture, I thought about this having Patty take a picture of me on my couch, by my end table, with my water bottle and my cup of coffee. I told her if I only had a mini fridge and a microwave right here, I would never move. <laughs> never move. Except on Sundays. Poor church. <laughs> but I was remembering, whenever, and this is, this is how my mind tracks, whenever I'm reading this Old Testament verse about the Hebrews trying to unite as one nation under David's shepherding, God's leadership actually, as they turn their hearts back to home, I remember this song in a movie that I love to watch. And I've seen the movie first in the theater when you couldn't pause it, and I've seen it several times since. I love it. Whenever I feel like I need a good horror movie, this is my go-to. But in this movie, three fellas start singing, Show Me the Way to Go Home. Show Me the Way to Go Home. Do you remember that song? From Jaws, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's a good one. That's where they started that, uh, I think the Disney converted that into a cartoon called Finding Nemo. Is that right? No? That played better. Okay. <laughs> so, whole dance routine came out of it. But that song came from Jaws. Did you love it? You knew people were in trouble when the song started. Yeah, that was, it's too late by the time it gets faxed. It's too late, someone's already lost a leg. Yeah, that's way too late. They'll just flash around for a second. They're done. Man, I love that movie. Uh, man, it's, it's out there, these three guys, they go out, this is, this is a guy thing. Three guys out in the boat, it's late. They're waiting on the monster to come. All right? And of all the things they do, they start singing, show me the way to go home. You remember that scene? I think a lot of us have seen Jaws. If not, come over. I got it paused. I got it queued up. I was watching it this morning. Part of the song goes, part of the song goes, uh, show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. I had me a drink about an hour ago and it's gone right to my head. It's a, quite a silly moment in the midst of a great horror movie, right? These guys sitting in the hull of the boat, singing this song together, while the big sharks circling them. And I always wondered why that song. I mean, there's lots of other little songs they could have sung to take their minds off of the troubles that they were about to face. So why that one? Is it perhaps that it wasn't? A little distracting silly song but in fact it was what was really on their heart it was really their plea the veteran shark hunter the marine biologist and the land lover sheriff might be have given the words to what was in the back of their mind in this song get me out of here is what they're really thinking show me the way to go home my point is I'll get back on track. 
when things look bleak, when options run out, when enemies threaten, we want to go home. We want to go home. It's a natural impulse. Home is a place of safety, a place of peace. There is a pull towards home in the best of situations, not to mention the worst of situations. There's a pull within us to go, a yearning, if you will, like those birds that fly all the way south, you know, down into Mexico in the winter, and then they fly, all of a sudden they figure out how to get all the way right back to where they started, where home was in the summer. Or those salmon that swim against the current, upstream, jumping up waterfalls even, dodging grizzly bears to get home to their spawning grounds. Show me the way to go home. Robert Frost said that home is a place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Is that true enough? Isn't that true enough? Or do they? Or do they? Our Gospel writer Mark tells us of when Jesus went home. There doesn't seem to be much taking in in the story there and what's going on. The Gospel text tells us that Jesus goes home. Why Jesus goes home, Mark doesn't say. It's a very brief Gospel. It's written in a short amount of time. Mark isn't given to revealing Jesus' motivations and his deliberations. He just says, Jesus up and goes to his hometown. But we can imagine why, right? Can we imagine why? Why Jesus went home? We can imagine why? Because he's just like us, right? He's a lot like us. He's God incarnate, incarnate, inhuman. His humanity yearns to be home. He goes home because, well, it's home. It's home. He goes for comfort. He goes for identity's sake. He goes because maybe he thinks that Robert Frost is right. And that no matter what he's done to this point, they're going to take him in. And he's going to be welcomed back home. Or maybe he's riding on a bit of a high and wants to share it with those who know him best. Because in the previous chapters... It has Jesus performing all sorts of incredible acts. And now he's going home to let them see how the local boy is made good. Or maybe he's going home to try and heal what might have been broken by misunderstanding. And let me explain that out. Because a few chapters before, in chapter 3, Jesus healed a man uh, on the Sabbath. Do you remember he had a withered hand? And Jesus healed him. On the Sabbath. Wouldn't have been in trouble if he would have waited one day, but when Jesus saw a need, he felt compassion and healed him right then. Why does this man need to suffer one more second when I'm here? Now the crowds loved him, came by the hundreds to see him. Chapter 3 tells us Jesus took some time out to teach his disciples. He went up on the mountain. He taught them. He prayed with them. But word got back home. Word got back home. And their conclusion back home was that Jesus was crazy. Carpenter kids from Nazareth don't go off and do such things. He's upsetting the powers of being, drawing attention to himself in all sorts of ways. He must be off his rocker. So, brothers and mom, we're told, take off and go down to see him. And when they got there, where Jesus was, word got to Jesus that his mothers and his brothers were waiting uh, for him outside with one of those nice white coats that ties him back. Have you guys seen me wear mine? Jade, I know you have. Thanks for signing me out. Uh, so, uh, good stuff, yeah. When Jesus hears that his mom and brothers are outside, he says to those around him, including his disciples, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Now, if we take ourselves out of Jesus' shoes and put ourselves in mom and brother's shoes, that had to hurt, right? Am 
I, am I thinking right? Had to hurt. So maybe here in chapter 6, Jesus goes home to explain what he really meant. Maybe he goes to heal the hurts of misunderstanding. Maybe he goes to give the family another chance to catch the larger vision of what family might mean. His vision of what family might mean to live in the world in which we live. So he tries again. And it works, at least for a second. I gotta admit, it's real close there. We almost have a full sentence in Mark where it really goes together well when Jesus gets up and speaks. He gets about two positive comments and then a lot of other stuff. As he spoke in the synagogue, and our Bibles tell us they were astonished by him for a moment. And when they listened to his words, I think quite a few of them were knocked out of themselves for a moment. I think they might have got it. They were swept up in his vision of what the world could be. They leaned into his promise, God's promise, until someone said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't that the carpenter kid? Who does he think he is? And at that point, everything falls apart. It all falls apart. They turn away from him because they thought they knew him. They thought they knew him. They turned against him because they thought he should stay in his place. They called him, actually they called him names, son of Mary. They didn't call him son of Joseph, right? Which gives to play that his parentage was suspect. They laughed, they sneered, they ignored him. And even Jesus, our Bibles tell us, was amazed at their unbelief, their disrespect. Jesus went home, but home didn't take him in. Now, if it was me, if it was me in such a circumstance, I'd begin to feel pretty sorry for myself. Poor me, they don't understand me. They don't understand the real me. The me I've become. They still see that goofy kid that I was instead of the man I have become. Man, if it was me back then, I would have had a full-on three-year-old pity party. There would have been stomping. You would have heard it for miles. You would have heard it for miles. I've seen three-year-olds do this recently. <laughs> All right, I know how they get thrown. I have been amazed at the volume and ferocity. Why not? Because it destroys that sense of what home should be. I think it destroys that desire to go home. Or maybe better, there's within us a desire to be home, to be welcomed home, to feel at home. And if home won't take you, what's left? What's left? What's left when you've left home or home has left you? Well, we see right here in our gospel reading. Just those few verses into chapter 6, what Jesus did when home left him. He makes a new one. He makes a new one. He introduces us to what home should be, what it should be like even here on earth. It should be like it's going to be in heaven. Our Bible tells us Jesus calls together the twelve and he sends them out two by two. He set about to create a sense of community, to build relationships, is what he does. To care for those that they met, to trust them, to rely on them, to make themselves at home with them. That's Jesus' vision of evangelism and of mission. 
And keep in mind, to Jesus, he never separated those two. Evangelism and mission, he never separated them. <clears throat> nope. Not as far as I can tell in my reading. Jesus' vision of evangelism and of mission is not one of winning souls or by drive-by mission efforts. No, instead Jesus seems most interested in relationships. That's what it's about. Relationships. His work is done in the presence of relationships. And because they refuse to enter into a relationship with him when he goes home, he could do no deed of power. Not there. The deeds that he did were deeds of compassion. That was his very nature. And you can't change the nature of God. Home's not so much a place as it is a level of relationship, my friends. It is a welcome. Robert Frost was right. When you're really home, they will take you in but Jesus tells us that home is about a commitment to a vision of home that he calls the kingdom of God. And he tells us it can be here with us as it will be in heaven. It's about relationships. It's about a commitment to love one another with the same kind of love that Jesus pours out on us. In other words, I think it's, it's Jesus is showing us the way to go home. On this holiday weekend, it seems to me that what we really celebrate is neither a historical event nor the glories of a richly blessed nation. No, instead it's an ideal, a vision of what we could be what we long to be as a nation, as a people. We who call the United States of America home love our country, but at the same time, we still hope for more. More justice for all. More equality. More friendliness and kindness to one another. We celebrate who we are today. Even as we celebrate who we might be, and we hold these truths to be self-evident. This is true of every nation, no doubt. We all want a country that feels like home. Which means we need people. Because home is about relationships. We need all the people. Of the people, by the people, for the people. We need all the people to show us the way to go home. To show us a way to be home. A home for all of God's children. That's the blessing we live in today. For all people, we have to see, as those Israelites saw David, we're, we're bone and flesh. We're relatives. We are the family of God. Show me the way home. That's our call. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. This morning we are truly blessed, not only that it's Independence Day here in our nation, but also that we get to share in the grace available to us through our sacraments of bread and cup. Jesus showed us this gift, left it with us. He said, use it as a willingness to, for inward change to allow grace to manifest itself and to join together. We who walked in, you may have walked in by yourself, you may have walked in as a couple. You still walked in yourself. Now join with all of us as the family of God. We share in a meal together. So let us do so at this time. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Oh, it is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of the universe, ruler of the nation, judge of all flesh. You have placed us, your people, in this land made rich with rivers, forests, mountains, 
and creatures great and small. Here you set before the founders and pioneers of this nation an opportunity beyond measure to build a realm of justice, peace, and freedom. Here you continue to call your people freed from the law and baptized into Jesus Christ to be a sign of your reign in all the world. For such a place, such a vision, and such a calling, we give you thanks, Lord. Praying that we may ever join afresh the dreams you have set before us. And so, with your people in every land, on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, above all, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who sends us into the world to declare the good news of your kingdom to every creature. Justice to all peoples. Good news to the poor, release for prisoners, sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. Now, on the night before he was arrested and sentenced to death by authorities of his own nation, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving. Each of us has a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pray with me. God of all nations, we pour ourselves out before you in praise and thanksgiving. A holy and living sacrifice in union with your offering for us. <laughs> Pour out your spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make Christ known to us in the breaking of this bread and the sharing of this cup. Renew our fellowship in him. That we may be for the world his body poured out for the world at this time in this nation. And at this great banquet in the fullness of your new creation. Where justice flows like rivers. Righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Where none shall hunger or thirst. Neither shall they learn war anymore. By him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Let us do join together in sharing this. Come with an open and willing heart, willing to receive Christ and his blessings for us. you come.
Thank you.